right. So, um, okay, this is where I am right now. I am in a, in an office trailer at at Merritt Merritt College in the Oakland Hills. Uh, that that's a community college. This is a view from outside of my trailer, looking towards the bay, and what you see is haze and smoke from all the forest fires. If this was clear, you would be looking at downtown Oakland, the San Francisco Bay, and then San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge. But this is what we see today. So they call it Oakland for a reason, you know, especially near the bay and the flatlands. It used to be all a natural oak woodland. Uh, but in the hills, there are pockets, big valleys that are native redwood uh, habitat. And the redwoods are, you know, they were pretty much all cut down but we have some pretty impressive second growth here now. Uh, so I'll talk about that and I'll give you a little bit of local history related to that since here we are. We had about a month ago, uh, Captain Monkey and I were talking about going down to uh, the Santa Cruz mountain for this event uh, at a place called Camp Harmon, which is near Mount Hermon where we had a, a rendezvous years ago if, you, if you've been to that. Uh, but there was a huge forest fire and it's uh, still fighting it. It's more or less under control, but you know, it's, it's ongoing situation. We couldn't get down there. Even if we could, we probably would not have a, a signal. And uh, you know, there is right now, there is a, a, a heat wave, uh, there's forest fires and there's rolling blackouts in California. So if, if, if we go blank, that's what's happening. Uh, so the, the, all the, Redwoods in Oakland were cut down, except this one. This one is known as the Old Survivor. This is in Leona Canyon, which is right below where I'm sitting right now at Mayard College. And then a little bit like quarter mile north of here, there is a huge park called Redwood Regional Park. And that has a uh, you know, big valley with, with streams and, and good sized redwoods. Um, so, you know, this tree, you know, where people were talking about it and people don't even notice it. It's sort of off to the side and it's on a steep hillside. There are no trails there, you know. So, but I figured, well, since this is the survivor, I wanted to check it out better. So I, I measured it. Uh, you know, the height is, is 117. It's kind of small for a redwood and it's a triple trunk. And these are the sizes of the trunk. So I assume partly because there's a triple trunk and because it's on a very, very steep section, uh, that's why it was left. They never got around to cutting it down because they cut everything else in this canyon and there were some really big ones. Um, but there is a little stone that measures it by a school down here, the old survivor redwood. Uh, they, it was tested with an increment borer and they counted the rings. So they put up this stone in 19, 81 and at that time they estimated at 425 years old they weren't totally sure that they got right to the center on the ring counts but you know that's about as old as, as it is so when i climbed the tree uh so this is a little bit clear view here even there's a cloudy day you see san francisco and san francisco bay and uh, the houses are super close it's, it's just like hiding there in plain view i mean it's, Several people asked me, where is that? Can you show it to me? I said, well, maybe. So anyway, there it is. You're looking right at the, uh, at the suburban houses up on the hill. And looking at the uh, foliage at the very top, you see how the needles are short and so and uh, sharp. Uh, and whereas the, the foliage at the bottom is, is wider, more feathery. And, and this, the foliage at the top is called sun, sun leaves. And they have a total different look, partially because they're up in the sun and wind, partially because of the dynamics of how water moves up, the pressure it takes to move, move water up, it has adjusted to that. Uh, so this guy here, Cameron Wills, uh, Williams, he studied that, the water dynamics in giant trees. That was his PhD dissertation. Uh, so also going back here, I, we have some old timers participant. Uh, he gave a talk at the Simpsonwood rendezvous in 2013 and he's still working with this type of stuff with with redwoods and giant sequoias and there he is with his wife Rekha she is a study in lichen so they have a good partnership going there they love to climb together uh, there were some redwoods in Oakland that were super big they might have been the biggest around there was a, a, a tree called the blossom rock tree on top of the hill near here 
And it was cut down like in the 1890 or something. It was never really measured in height, but the stump stayed there for decades. And the stump was reliably measured by people that documented it. It was 33.5 feet in diameter. So that's huge. So we always say that the, the coast redwoods are the, are the tallest and the giant sequoias are the most massive. They typically have a bigger diameter, but maybe not. Maybe this one, it beats the sequoias. And there is a plaque talking about that. And there's a ring of, of the reed sprouts around there. Uh, so the reason it's called Blossom Rock, which goes back in time, there was a British sea captain. He surveyed the San Francisco Bay in 1827. This was still Mexican California. And there was a rock very close to the surface. So he, uh, he figured out if you sight if you sight with the point of an island and and sight this tree called the navigation tree and you and and this is the bearing you take you will not hit the rock, so he documented that and he put that in a, in the navigation charts for other sailors, and at that time, this is his words at that time uh, the Mexicans called the redwoods Palos Colorados, a woodland of pines sitting on top of the hill, and Oakland was known as San Antonio. And uh, so here's a chart. The Blossom Rock is between Alcatraz Island and the city of San Francisco. And it was a major event in 1867 when they got enough dynamite together and blew it up. So it wasn't a hazard to navigation. And you know, this is like even before photography. So this, somebody painted this, painted this picture of the explosion and the whole town came out to watch it. So this is, um, where we are right now. This is where Oakland is. Uh, here's San Leandro or here's Berkeley. And the, uh, the uh, Spanish and later the Mexicans, they gave people land grants called ranchos and a family would have this area and they would run their cattle. So this was El Rancho de San Antonio, which is now Oakland. And then there was another El Rancho de uh, San Leandro. Then there was, a, there was, this was the Peralta family. On the other side of the hills, there was the Moraga family. Then there was up in the in the hills there were the redwood forest they called it Los Palos Colorados, public domain, and uh, they made an agreement. The landowners, the Peraltas and Maracas, they made an agreement. These trees are beautiful. We're not going to cut them. Also, they didn't use wood. They didn't have the technology to cut it and move it. And they you know they built adobe homes, some of which are still standing. So they didn't use a lot of wood. There weren't that many of them, but that was kind of. I was kind of impressed that that early they appreciated the beauty of the big trees. Well, then we had the gold rush, yeah, and then the uh, you know the Yankees and the Europeans came in, and they they you know started cutting like crazy and building towns and making money. Uh, so this is a big tree that was felled in Oakland, and here is a uh, you know how they moved the logs back in the day with the oxen, and they built these uh, bridges out of redwood logs to transport them on. And it was just cut, it was just clear cut. You know, you, you would think, well, you know, leave a few, wouldn't that be nice? But you know, it's all about greed, about money and competition. And actually, uh, it's different groups of loggers, they went into the redwoods, they set up camp and started cutting trees while it was still, you know, part of Mexico. So, so the, the Mexicans, the Peraltas and the Maragas, they organized groups of armed people and they went in there, they chased out the loggers. They said, leave these trees alone. But then after the gold rush, there were so many of them, they couldn't keep them out and they lost control. Uh, but there's one very nice redwood uh, forest that had been preserved in the Bay Area. This is Owen Marin, it's in a valley because it gets the fog and it's near the ocean. And uh, those trees were saved and it was made a national monument. Uh, th these trees are beautiful and uh, I used to take visitors there to show them you know, the big redwoods because it's close by, but then recently it gotten so crowded and now you can't even drive there anymore. You have to go someplace else and take a shuttle and take a number or whatever. So, so like when I had last year, when we had the, uh, the post rendezvous and I wanted to show people some old growth, we went to another, to Henry Cowell State Park that uh, you're not as crowded as all and, and very nice too. So uh, talking about the Coast Redwood native range, see it goes along the coast, of course, from a place called Big Sur, south of Monterey. And, uh, and then it goes up by about 10, 15 miles into Oregon, it stops right there. And the, uh, the range is determined by the you know, rain, temperature, fog and fire. It's 
the climate is mild, it rains a lot, and redwoods do well with fire unless it's get really, it gets really hot. And the further south you go on that range, the more the trees benefit from the fog. Further north, you will have a lot more rain. But for example, in the southern part of the range, you know, you come down there, the Big Sur Mountains, you see a lot of fog. So right here in Oakland, we got an average 24 inches. And that's, yeah, it's kind of low for a redwood, but the fog helps it. The fog hangs in the valleys. That's why they're here. And then the Prairie Creek up in Del Norte County, it's up to 100 inches of rain. Uh, the reason it's, it's uh, the rains is determined by fire is that the uh, other, when there's not a lot of fires, when you go up to Oregon and Washington, other trees are more competitive. So the fire is not a factor, but if you take, if you plant the redwood in Oregon or Washington State or British Columbia, it'll do fine. It, they still like the coastal climate and the moisture. So this is uh, last year's rendezvous at, uh, at Leckett on the Eagle River. And uh, this is right, pretty much right central to, to the Redwood Range in Mendocino, Northern Mendocino, close to Humboldt County. And uh, in this picture here, we have uh, John Traverso and, the, and the Jean climbing the big Reynolds tree. And uh, you see how that big dog lake and all that structure, see that you get that in, a, uh, in an old growth. The one that we are standing in front of in the group, it's a massive tree, it's very tall, but it's a second growth still. It'll take a hundred years or 200 more years and it'll get that whole complex structure. So uh, the fork helps the trees. It was discussed, does the fork go through into the needles or does it just drip and go into the roots? And that's fairly recent that, there, that people were actually able to prove that the leaves take them up because they will they can put some isotopes in some water drops and they will know it's the same water that went into the leaves that they, were, that, that they put there. So uh, there's a UC Berkeley redwood researcher. He estimates that 30 to 40% of the water that redwoods needs come from fog. And you know, like that depends on the whole range. Like I say, up, up north, there's more, there's more rain. Down south, they depend a lot more on the fog relatively. Uh, so here is a redwood. Uh, this I took this picture this morning. See, it's, it's smoky. Uh, this is the Berkeley Rose Garden, and um, this redwood, uh, it it's healthy. It's kind of sparse. It has a lot of gaps between branches, and it tapers rapidly. So that's what you see when a redwood is doesn't really have the total optimal amount of water. It doesn't get enough fog or rain, but it adapts and it grows slower and it, and, and it gets a little sparser and you know, it'll do, be like that for decades. Uh, then, you know, I looked across the road from there. This is called Cotonisis Creek. That means quail in Spanish. I, I'm learning Spanish one word at a time. And if you look at these redwoods, the one on the left are sparse and the one on the right are full. Well, that is where the creek is. So it's near the creek, it gets the water and it gets much fuller. They're both out in full light. Uh, so the fire is a big factor and we're having fires now. You see a lot of trees with fire scars when you go into the old growth, but that could be a fire that happened, you know, centuries ago. If the fire burns through the bark, which, you know, it's thick and full of moisture, then, you know, it might create a hollow. It might smolder in there for a long time, but the rest of the tree and the outside perimeter has enough moisture in it that it'll survive. So here is a example of fire and, and in 1991, we call the Oakland Hills fire or firestorm. And I, I was working for a tree company right in the zone that burned. And we were in there, first we were bringing the equipment out because the boss was in Hawaii. He's calling us, hey, get the, get the trucks out. And like, okay, we had to you know, run the police barricades to get in there. And then after we got those out, I started helping some people evacuate. I mean, it was total chaos. And then after the fire, we went back in and we were working for a lot of insurance companies and we were remove burned trees or dead trees, but the redwoods, they came back, you know, they were, the branches are burned. They were, they were looking black and charred and we told people, no, they're gonna come back, they're alive. And sure enough, they did. So, so that's, that's what they do. That's the, one they, the way they survived so many years. And this is that same fire, you know, this was total chaos. This is Claremont Hotel in Berkeley. 
everything beyond the hotel burned. They've saved the hotel with, with water drops, but uh, all the all the houses up in the hills, it, it was it was gone. It was like three thousand homes. And uh, it happened in October. It happened in October twenty first, and it's the exact same kind of weather we have today. Very hot, and it has that feeling. You get the smoke. You get the a little bit of wind from the inland. So. We'll see, we are still in the middle of fire season. Here was a fire in um, up in Sonoma County, 2017. A lot of times after a fire like that, you will see standing trees and you the houses are gone. So, you know, people always talk about, oh, it's the trees, you gotta get rid of the trees. It's no, the fire goes, it's, typically it's spot, it spots from house to house. The heat might kill a tree, but it's not gonna, you might have killed it or it's still standing. So it's the worst thing is is like shingle roofs, shake roofs, and they'll spot the fire. Uh, so anyway, I was we having some big fires right now, uh, and I was just, these are just headlines from this morning. There was a gender reveal sparked a wildfire in California that has grown to seven thousand acres. That was yesterday. Now wh what that what they did? They had this you know family thing, and they set up a bunch of fireworks to celebrate. Well, that didn't work out well. And uh, most fires are, are caused by human activity. When you have the right weather, it doesn't take much. You know, it could just be, you know, you can have a, uh, a lawnmower, you know, a blade hit, hit a rock and a spark. Somebody throwing a cigarette out the window. Recently, a couple of weeks ago, we had actually natural fires. We had the unusual amount of, of thunder and lightning. So this is the way, when you look back over time, this is where these fires came, came from going back over the centuries. And here we have, you know, all time record heat from yesterday, it threatens power supply. We have this, uh, you know, private organization that has a monopoly on the power and they don't uh, always maintain the trees like they should. So uh, they just, you know, turn off the power if they're worried about something. So far, so good. And there was a scary one yesterday. The helicopters had to bring some people out. They, the road out where they were camping was in the fire. So this is a, uh, uh, you know, a state park of old growth redwoods. All the buildings, fences, stuff like that, all burned. You know, people couldn't get in there because of the fire, and everybody was saying, "Oh my God, we lost Big Basin." You know, some people said, "No, baby, the trees will make it." So here is our governor Newsom, touring the site, looking at the fires, and yeah, the trees more or less made it. They will, it'll be different. They're gonna go in and, you know, and look at it and do their little risk analysis. So they probably won't open it for a long time, but it's still there. Okay, well, the main characteristic that people know about redwoods is the height. The current champion tallest tree in the world is Hyperion, 380 feet. Here it is compared to some landmarks. And when we talk about the, the height of trees, there are some tall tales from the past that are even taller, but there are also some that are verified. So looking into that, we got some taller trees. A mountain ash, Eucalyptus regnans, where the current champion is 327. There was a uh, 435 feet that, was, that had fallen. And they considered reliable people measured it and reported on it. There was a, a redwood up by the Eel River, 424 feet. That was felled in 1886. So the Eel River, that's where we, where we had last year's rendezvous. There was the Eel River right there. And the Douglas fir gets super tall. They don't get quite as old, but there was a 410 feet Douglas fir up in Canada. So uh, but what I find interesting is, uh, is the tallest trees in England, the seven tallest trees in England are all from right here, from the American West Coast. And uh, these are all native to California and further up. So this guy here, David Douglas, he explored the, uh, the, the West Coast back in 1824 to 34 and he collected seeds, he sent the seeds back to England. They planted them and these are now the tallest trees. So we got a Douglas fir is the tallest one. Then we have a giant sequoia, you know, grand fir, etc. And these are um, back in Denmark where I grew up as a little tree climber. This is, uh, I took a picture down of my Boy Scout camp from a, a fir tree there. So the main trees in Denmark that I used to climb the tallest trees, uh, the conifers are were all from here because they are like, uh, it's a lumber tree, they, it's like tree farms. You know, the native Danish trees, you know, beech and oaks, you know, there's a different 
situation, but the conifers they grow are all like Sitka spruce, Douglas fir. So yeah, I didn't realize that until I came over here that, oh, I know, I know these trees. Uh, of age, of course, here we are last year down at Henry Cowles State Park. And uh, looking at the rings, you know, you get the, an old growth, you get much tighter rings and you do usually second growth. And we're comparing here. So the, uh, it's up to 2,200 years. And that is, uh, that is old for a, for a tree, obviously, but it's not the oldest species. That is a bristlecone pine, also native to California. And uh, so that, that has been documented up to close to 5,000 years old. You know, so, uh, you know, people like to brag about California. They said, well, if we were a country, we would be the fifth largest economy in the world. I think, yeah, whatever, you know, I don't care. But if we were a country, we would have the biggest tree, the tallest tree, and the oldest tree. So you can't beat that. So the redwoods reproduce two ways, and that's part of the, the way they're successful. And they will reproduce by seeds and by sprouting from the base or from the wood. And you know, a lot of conif conifers don't do that. A lot of conifers will not sprout. If you take, uh, you know, most pine trees, if you remove all the foliage, you over prune it and chop it, they, it's gone. There's a few that'll sprout some, but, but redwoods, they are very adaptable. They will sprout. So, um, and you know, we have, we have lost almost all the old growth. There's my, maybe 5% left. And the reason that we still have the second growth is because, yeah, it just came back. You know, nobody planted it, but it sprouted back. And uh, this is down here be, below me here at Merritt College. This is an albino redwood. And these you see once in a while and, they, and people are like, what the hell? You know, this doesn't have no chlorophyll. How does it live? Well, that just, what it does, it, it'll connect to the roots and the roots will graft to roots from other trees. It'll get its carbohydrates from there. It just sort of shows the adaptability of redwoods and the genetic diversity. It'll find a way to make it. So this, this, uh, I hope this, this uh, albino is still there. I haven't been there in a while, but I'm, I'm keeping it secret. So the old growth, you know, which, which I said, like I said, is maybe five percent left, is very different from second growth. So you have large trees with large branches. You have a diversity of age and size. What you get with second growth is because it was clear cut and they came back, then they're all the same size. And they all, they all shoot up, they compete for the light. You, get, you, ha you might have one stump that sets up 10 shoots and then they compete. So you get trees that get tall, but they don't get as wide and the branches don't get as big. They, they drop their, their lower branches. Uh, and they have multiple layers in the canopy. And also in old growth, you have large down dead trees and you have occasional gaps in the canopy and you have epiphytes, you know, plants that live up in the canopy. They can get a foothold and that creates more diversity for a lot of species. You know, the typical structure of an old growth, this is a tree we climbed down at uh, Mount Harmon. And you get these like dog legs, a branch would come out and it goes up. And the redwood, coastal redwood forest has the largest biomass of any ecosystem. It beats the tropical forest like in the Amazon, even though that has a lot of biomass, but it's just so massive. And uh, some of the species that depend on the, on the old growth here is one called the marbled muralip. This is an ocean going uh, bird and people knew about it and they, they would see it in the ocean. Sometimes they would see it from a ship miles and miles from shore and everybody's like, what? Where does this bird nest? Nobody knew. Well, there was a tree climber that, that found their nest in the Santa Cruz mountains on a, uh, you know, an old growth tree. And they, they need, they build a little nest like that on a branch. So they need old growth. They need a branch that's wide enough to support it. And then the spotted owl, that nest in cavities. So when you have old growth, you also have dead standing trees or decaying trees. And they have, you know, cause the owl is not going to go in and create its own cavity like a woodpecker. It's gonna to have to find one that's already there. So that's why you need the, uh, the old growth. Uh, here's another species, a kind of trout. And this is, you know, was, was described as a separate species right here in Redwood Regional Park. And they, uh, they are now they're spawning again in Redwood Creek. And uh, I used to work for the parks and I was very involved in that. And that thing that's supposed to keep the dogs out of the creek and it's a popular, popular trail to take the dogs on and it's it's a big fight 
you know, we're trying to educate people, keep the dogs out of there, don't mess with the spawning salmon, I mean the trout. The wandering salamander, this is a salamander that lives its entire life up in the redwood canopy. And that was found described by Steve Sillet, who did a lot of research by climbing redwood trees. Here he is with his team. And, uh, you know, he, before he really got up there, you know, few people got up there, or if they did, they weren't scientists. You know, they were probably crazy or something, but he, he really created a, um, a whole field of redwood canopy studies. And, uh, you know, the, it's described in the book, The Wild Trees. Okay, here we have our friend Nick and uh, showing a big leaf maple. It, it's finally, there's a common name of a tree that makes sense. These are companion species of the redwood forest. You know, all, uh, big leaf maple is riparian, semi-riparian, the oldest are riparian, and they're understory trees or they're along the river, or the rivers and creeks. The Douglas fir, they have this characteristic cone. So they always, they are mixed in with the, uh, with the redwoods, certain areas and they share the canopy. Tan oak is a common understory species. This has unfortunately proven to be very susceptible to salt milk death. So uh, a lot of them have lost certain areas, Marin County, Santa Cruz County, you go through certain areas where all tan oaks are dead. Uh, these are nice trees, you know, and I hope they will develop some genetic resistance and we'll figure out how to keep them. And, uh, you know, they're called tan oak because they, they, they was used for tanning in leather and stuff. So they have a lot of tannin in them, I guess. Okay, so here's a little anecdote uh, of a redwood. This is called the moon tree. They took, they took some redwood seeds and they sent them to the moon and back at the Apollo 14 mission in 1974. They planted one of them right here up at uh, Tilton Park. And, you know, they're going to see, well, since it's been to the moon, is it going to be different? Well, it's not different, but it, it, it's doing well. It's about 120 feet tall now. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the gardeners up there noticed that it's got these, these, uh, this narrow attachment dual tops. I talked about that in the, in the tree risk talk. When you get that, you get two tops that are about the same diameter and a narrow angle, and then you get included bark between them. That's a very weak spot. And they both get one sided reaching for the light. And then if you do get a, uh, one, you get a strong wind and one of them breaks, then you have a big wound there and you have a one sided tree. So, uh, you know, they asked me, could I take care of that? And they said, well, I don't know if you can climb it. And we called the tree service. They said, this tree cannot be climbed. You know, you can't reach it with equipment, a bucket truck, you know? So I said, well, Next time, call me first, no problem. So there we go. And so I made this cut, you just make the best cut you can, but it's early enough, because when you make a cut like that, there's no natural barrier to decay like there is when you move a branch, when you move a predominance uh, trunk. But this, this is gonna sprout back from there, and then there's still enough growth on the other side of the one that's gonna take over as a top. So this is a couple of years ago, actually, I have to go back and look at it, how it came back. Uh, what is in a name? Coast Redwood, common name. Also Palo Colorado was, was a Mexican name for it or California Redwood. So pretty simple, not too weird. It was called Taxodium sempervirens when it was first described. Taxodium is a bald cypress. Well, they knew the bald cypress from, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, and Louisiana. So they say, oh, this looks similar. This, we put this in the same genus. The, well, the bald cypress, of course, is the citrus. Well, this one is evergreen sempervirens. So there was a name. Then it was later decided that this is a separate genus. So this is the only species that has the genus Sequoia. It was named after a, uh, a Cherokee that did, there was a Sequoia. His name was Sequoia, and he he was impressed when he saw the uh, the newcomers reading and writing, and he he created a uh, alphabet to write down the Cherokee language with 84 letters and apparently it was very successful they said the, the Cherokee people they were they had a higher literacy rate using that than the uh, the settlers at the time so he's uh, an amazing has an amazing story something to check out if you're interested so our case is a different species that are related to coast redwood these four species used to be in the same family called Taxidacea. Now they changed it, now they're all in Cupressaceae, but they are related. 
And there's a giant sequoia, the dawn redwood, bald cypress, and the Montezuma cypress. And we will take a look at those. Uh, so just to compare the ranges, because the two trees can get confused, and, and some people call the giant sequoia redwood also. So here we have the coastal redwood in the coastal ranges, but the giant sequoia are in the foothills of the, uh, of the Sierra Mountains. So they're inland, it's totally different environment they get they get snow and they don't get the fog uh and they are not not like a continuous forest but they are in a bunch of groves so these are the groves there are some in yosemite there's some further down king's canyon and grand sequoia there's a few north of yosemite so they're kind of the you know their range has shrunk over the centuries they get smaller and smaller and they're just but they're hanging on they find a niche where they do well so this is a, uh, the biggest tree that is known. We got a 275 feet tall and we got a 25 foot diameter. So we have a huge uh, volume of wood and an estimated age of maybe up to 2,700 years. Uh, so here's the detail of the giant sequoia. Yeah, the cones and the, the needles are quite a, quite a lot different from the coast redwood. So when we talk about names again, uh, it was known as a big tree or a sheer redwood or a giant sequoia. When it was first described, it was called the Wellingtonia gigantea. Now, a whole bunch of American botanists were protesting because Wellington was a British admiral. So they said, no, 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 this should be named after an American. It, anyway, it was put in the same genus as the coast redwood. It was called sequoia gigantea. But then it was, it was also put in the same genus as the uh, bald cypress. It became Taxodium. But then later it, be it became its own genus. It is the, own, the only tree that has that genus, Sequoia dendron, and that's the way it stays. Okay, John Muir, he, uh, uh, he was a founder of the, uh, the Sierra Club. He came out to California and he explored the mountains and especially the trees. He was a total tree lover. He has an amazing life. And uh, he's very famous and well known in California. Uh, he's, he was born in Scotland. I think maybe he's not so famous in the British Isles, but he should be. Uh, he, uh, he had a house out in Martinez in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he planting a little, a little sapling of a giant sequoia that he brought down from the mountains in about 18, 1890 uh, or something like that. And now it's not looking so good. It didn't grow that fast. And the National Park Service, who, who has this land as a, as a national monument, they decided, well, this tree is dying, but we're going to clone it. So they took some shoots and they sent it to the Archangel Project and they're cloning it. So I thought that was a great idea for sure, make a clone. But I also told them, well, maybe it's not dying. Maybe it's just not been given a chance to because of the conditions that you guys are growing it. So I took a, you know, take a look at the base. When you have a trunk that goes straight down, there's no flare, you know the grade has been raised. And there's a little, some path around there where equipment drives, you know, maybe there's equipment driving there when it's been rained. So you have compacted soil and raised soil, and that is really poor conditions for root growth, especially for a tree like the giant sequoia that is from the mountains where they like to have good drainage. So I told them, well, uh, can I uh, see if I can do something for this tree? You know, and I it had to do, I had to do a little convincing, but finally they said, okay. So my friend, John Traverso, he has a, uh, an air spade. And uh, we went out there with the help of a, cu a couple other arborists. We did what's called radial trenching. We made trenches going out like spokes on a wheel. We lowered the grade, we put compost in there. And uh, we were just talking about that yesterday. Actually, we have to go back and check on it. You know, I, I see it from the freeway. You can see it from the freeway. It looks okay, but I need to get up close and get in there. And hopefully it did, did the trick. Uh, here's another giant sequoia. When you talk about the uh, basal flare, when you see that flare at the base, that's a good thing. This, and then when they're young, they tend to get the pyramid shape. And later they, they drop the lower branches and become more like tower. So this is... Uh, the tree that's doing fairly well, you know, there's some lawn there that gets irrigated, so it can tap into some water. It's got the basal flare. 
in the, the same location, you turn around and look at a row of giant sequoias. These two here are looking sparse. So what happened there? We take a closer look. You can tell that they, uh, it goes down the, to the ground like a post. The grade has been raised. So what they did was they created a little parking area there. They, put, they brought in some fill and they covered a big part of the root zone. And uh, the tree, they couldn't make it. They had to be removed. So uh, if you did that to a coast redwood, it might survive. A coast redwood, they, they typically live in these alluvial floodplains where once in a while you get a flood, then you get silt built, built up. And if they get surrounded by silt, they will actually create new roots known as adventitious roots and go out into the silt. You know, the, uh, the sequoias won't do that. And the, uh, the sequoias will not sprout from the stump. You know, they, they need uh, very specific conditions. They need a good drainage. Dawn redwood. This tree is interesting in that this tree was known from fossils and it was described, but it was thought to be extinct. So they knew these fossils and it was actually, these are found in North America. It was widespread. Then in the 1930s, somebody found it, a live population in the mountains of China. There's a Chinese botanist and he was in connection with this guy from UC Berkeley. Uh, meanwhile, the Second World War happened intervened, he couldn't go there, so he waited. As soon as the war was over, he went over there, he looked at the trees and collected seeds. So here we have some in, uh, in Berkeley that, that, that are grown for those seeds that he planted in, in 1949. It's a nice graceful tree, it's a deciduous redwood. It has become popular in the, uh, in the nursery trade. Um, so here, Oh, yeah, yeah, what I wanted to show, it's in some ways it looks similar to a bald cypress. It's a little bit hard to tell, but this is on the right is dawn redwood foliage. It's opposite. On the left is the bald cypress. That's alternate. That's one difference. And uh, another difference is the, the trunks are very different. So, you know, apart from that, oh, here we have the uh, giant sequoia going from the left. You know, coast redwood and dawn redwood. You can see the difference in foliage and cones. Okay, bald cypress, Taxodium disticum, is you know in the same group. Like I said, it used to be in the same family. This is you know the swamps down in Louisiana that has a you know a lot of history and a lot of interesting people live out there. I put in a little time down there doing some tree work. Uh, you probably have them in Florida too. I'm going to have to ask Nadia about that. So uh, I love these trees. These are great. So we planted some in, in Fremont, California, which is just a little bit south of Oakland. This is in a quarry that has become a water reservoir for, for, for the water district there. So we put these trees in baskets and put wires around them because the water fluctuates. All of a sudden, there's no water. The deer can walk up to them. So, uh, sometimes the water is so high that they, you don't see them. They're totally on the water. Pretty much any tree you try to do that to, it'll die. Ball stripers, they're fine, they love it. And uh, one of my friends is a, uh, is sort of a, a gorilla ninja tree, tree planter. And he, he also in the same area, he, years ago, he planted ball cypress, you know, and then, you know, nobody realized what was, what was happening. So you got a little, you got a little bayou there in Fremont. But anyway, you know, the trees are different in Louisiana, so are the people. This when I was working down there. This is my, my co-worker. He was known as Bushy Head. He is uh, operating the stump grinder off my truck that I was living in, you know, barefooted, drinking a Budweiser, you know, it's standard. And uh, here he is in the evening, got back at the still, you know, getting some, waiting for the drops to come out for the good stuff. So these were some crazy times, you know, I, I, I had to leave because, you know, it's hot and humid and, uh, and the mosquitoes are biting and you drink moonshine every night and suddenly it's like, mm, you know, it's, it's fun for a while. I'm going back to California. Uh, okay, the fourth tree in the group is the, uh, the Montezuma Cypress. This tree is in Osaka, Mexico. And this has the largest diameter of any tree in the world that is known. So there you see all these school children around it. It's known as El Abol del Tule. Taxodium mucronatum. And I love these trees. I actually planted some of them. I, for a while, I was a supervisor of a trail system in the parks. And I became like the SPCA of, uh, of oddball trees because I was known to plant trees. So people had grown trees from seeds and where we're we gonna put them, they brought them to me and I planted them here and there. And 
you know, I, I had fun with it and I, I figured out how, how to bring in water. We had a big water water tank we could blow up, put in the back of the trucks. Uh, and we, the park district kind of had an official policy to plant native trees, you know, which, you know, I somewhat agree with in certain places, but this was, this was, a, you know, a man-made landscape. A lot of it was levees and, and, and great parking areas and stuff. So, uh, so I planted this one, actually, I haven't seen it in a while, but this one took right off a Montezuma Cypress in one of our staging areas. And, you know, my boss asked me one time, are these trees native? And I said, yeah, they're native. And then I said real quietly, yeah, to Mexico. So they're still doing good. It's nice to see. Anyway, I want to talk, uh, to end with this, we, we had Stuart Moskowitz give us a, a nice talk at the rendezvous last year. So the, he's carrying that on that tradition of Save the Redwoods League, which is started about 100 years ago. They are still, still going strong and fighting for the Redwoods. Here is Julia Butterfly Hill, spent two years in the tree and it worked. They saved the tree and this is now the this, this sanctuary forest that Stuart is in charge of. And uh, okay, thank you very much. Please give me your questions.